Hello, I am Jake Collins, and this is Nightmare Series 6, Episode 11, which was first broadcast on the 20th of November, 1992. Again, just like I did with Series 5, I'm going to be talking about winning Dungeoneer Ben actually winning. But, also like last time, that's not because I rate the winning team. It's just because I have certain things I want to say about the episode. I talked last time about how I didn't really like this pickle and the book of quests style of opening. In this episode, they have the kind of music, atmospheric noises track in the background as well, which they keep until the end of the series, adds to the sense of excitement and tension about, ooh, Ben's nearly won, and unlike Alan's nearly won, Ben really is actually going to go on and win. But this was, at the time, an excellent cliffhanger. Trick or treat. Only one is correct, and when you come back to watch Nightmare next Friday, you'll find out if the team are going to choose the correct spell. Or die here so close to victory because they picked the wrong one. But actually, if you stop and think about it, that's never going to happen, is it? I'm quite sure whichever one they picked, trick or treat, Borderus would have turned up and given them the spell Splash to defeat Lord Fear. It's a foregone conclusion, like much of this quest, really. And that's a point I will come back to later. I do believe that this quest is filling the at least one winner per series requirement by hook or by crook. But of course that really wasn't important at the time when this was first on. As I said before, as a first watch, as a viewing experience week by week, not looking back and analysing it to the nth degree, it's incredibly exciting. You're always going to come back and see the result of a cliffhanger like that. And even if you think, well, they'll probably win anyway, which I think I did. There's always that part of you that's not sure, and that's the kind of tension that Nightmare does create very, very effectively. In many ways, it's a shame not to have been able to watch it only once and be left with these marvellous impressions forever. The Caverns of Gore is a pretty good level 3 location. It's a bit like Winteria in Series 5, in that it's not very consistent. We don't really see it elsewhere in level 3, apart from here in Ben's winning quest. And thus, again, we have a problem with level 3 having its own identity atmosphere. As I mentioned last time, Alan didn't get very far into level 3, it was very nondescript. When Sophia is in level 3, in episodes to come, we won't really see the caverns of gore, certainly not like we're seeing them now. Sophia has a very nondescript level 3, with very general rooms that you might see anywhere, right up to the Great Causeway. And then when she turns up there, and it's got the cavernous surroundings, I remember first watching that and feeling like, oh yeah, 
the caverns of gore are supposed to be the big final dungeon location in series six but we haven't heard about them in sophia's quest this is the first we've seen of them it's much more effective here in ben's quest where they're really built up as a significant level three location we see ben wandering around the subterranean caverns giving the impression of being alone far beneath the earth deep in the dungeon just like i was saying with that earliest level three appearance in series one so i like the caverns of gore for that pretty effective as a level three location but as i say like winteria underused and only really properly featured in one quest but they are better than Winteria when we do see them. This is the Great Causeway, of course, and I've always liked this. When Paul McIntosh was writing about causeways for the Ice Shield fanzine, he picked that bit we've just had with Ben's team and the numbers on the Great Causeway as being particularly exciting, nerve wracking nightmare. And I do agree totally with that. At the time, it was very tense. Ooh, they haven't got the rest of the combination. Where are they going to go? Are they going to make it? Phew, they just made it. Of course, despite what the advisors think, there really is no rest of the combination that they missed. It's two, comma, three, comma, question mark, question mark, question mark, because you're supposed to work out, well, yeah, two, three, four, five. But it's still terribly tense and exciting to have Jane say we missed out something and we got it right by a complete guess. So those moments of tension and atmosphere on the Great Causeway are excellent. I've always enjoyed them. And here's that one piece of Causeway variation in Series 6 that I mentioned last time. On the second part of the Great Causeway, Path, P-A-T-H. They had to spot that quite quickly, didn't they, with that Fright Night timer? And they did, but I guess it's quite an easy word to spot. There is some pretty good guidance. Ben is out of the door there, before the blocks around the A of Path have fallen. I enjoyed that bit of variety when I first watched this, actually spelling out a word on a causeway. As I mentioned the last time, it's the one time in Series 6 where it's not a number sequence. And that's the only time we see a Dungeoneer walk a word path across a causeway in Nightmare. Seems like it should have happened more, really, I always think. It's quite a good obvious but effective thing to do with a causeway spell out a word by walking across the letters but that's all you get of it path i don't count the find bit because the slabs aren't dropping off as they do it i suppose it's most like the activity i was talking about on my commentary for the very first episode of nightmare in the simple starter chamber walking on the letters for open and Sesame, as the first two Dungeoneers ever did in that first episode ever. So perhaps that was a reason I always liked that second part of the Great Causeway. It's very nightmarish. It reminds me of classic nightmare. I do like that, and I'd have liked to have seen walking on letters to spell a word some more, as I say. This final confrontation with Lord Fear is pretty good. I like the surroundings of the caverns of gore for it. Suitably atmospheric for a final level three big bad guy confrontation. The problem is with the staging, you can see that Lord Fear wears women's tights. You can't really see that when he's with his pool of veracity. 
But there, when he's sitting up on that high rock, you can see it very clearly. I do think it's better in Series 7 when he gets himself some proper trousers that go with the rest of his costume. This was very exciting, running back through the dwarf tunnels with the crown, Pickle beckoning Ben excitedly. I did find it quite disappointing when they reused that Pickle beckoning with Chris and the lightning rod at the end of the series. It seemed rather lazy. But here we are, the Series 6 winners have won, and they look absolutely not bothered at all about it. I was quite pleased with Cordris turning up here to congratulate them, like Merlin did that one time, and I thought when I first watched this Merlin probably always had, even though that was a false impression. Cordris only turns up on the screen. In the next series, they realise, oh, let's have him come into the antechamber to give out the trophies. Or in this case, trophy. In series 5 and 6, they just get the one trophy to share. Skin flints. Winning scenes are always a bit of an anti-climax, really, for the team and for the viewers. It's quite easy to understand why that happens. It's playing the game that counts, as Trey God says. That's the exciting bit. That's the engaging bit. Once they've actually won, it's bound to be something of an anti-climax. They can't live up to the brilliant process of actually playing, watching, and engaging with Nightmare. Here's Sophia. This team is my favourite team of this series, my personal champion team of the series. I think they do by far the best job, and they're not done any favours, of course. Being four girls and coming hot on the heels of a winning team. Now this creates a very odd effect, having Hordrus pop straight back onto the screen when he's just been there a few moments before, but this time it's kind of a faulty connection and he's in a trance. Very at odds with what we've just seen. In terms of filming, it would be a whole different day. I don't think they really thought about the effect it was going to create for the viewers. Which is, or at least should be, the first thing whoever is making a TV programme should consider. And it's not always the case. There's a mistake here with not calling the advisors in before Hordris comes to tell us about the dragon caller. The advisors do turn up. And they know all about it. They've obviously heard what Hordris has to say, but they're not sitting there listening to him. It takes a few watch-throughs on video to notice that and be bothered by it, but I think I was being bothered by it by the end of 1993, having watched it on video several times. It's a mistake they correct immediately with the next quest, the final quest in the series, Chris and Friends. They get the advisors in, and then Hordris and Sidras talk to them on the screen. But it matters less there, because Hordris has given a ton of information about their task for level 1, finding the dragon caller in this quest, and obviously the advisors needed to know that, and how did they know that? They should have been sitting there watching it, just like Sophia was standing there watching it.
It's a nice overriding plot for the closing stages of the series. The Red Dragon, which leads up to the final exciting scene at the end of the series with the dragon falling on Mount Fear. I did enjoy that at the time. It's something extra to add to the show, to engage with the world. Similarly with the troll, full stroke king of the trolls in series seven. They're nice little additions to the closing stages of the series. And in series six, it really is for the whole second half of the series. Probably at its best here with the most continuity. Good stuff. Red Death, his contribution to the show. The Hall of Choice here. Why is the crown there? We only just had the crown. Ben just brought it back. And now Sophia's choosing it as well. I mean, Traegar can't want the crown that much, can he? Ben gives it to him. He chucks it back down into the dungeon, and there it is, waiting in level 3 for Sophia to retrieve it in the very next quest. That has always bothered me. Surely they could have rubbed out the picture of the crown on the blue tile there, just had a solid blue tile. You would have Traegon and Pickle remark, Ah, oh, well, we've got the crown, so now you can choose between these three quest objects. There'd be more chance of them choosing the cup, for one thing. I thought it was rather good in Series 5, the way after Ben's team had redeemed the shield. It was no longer a choice of four quest objects, but a choice of three quest objects. The cup, the sword, or the crown, because we've already got one of them. So the Hall of Choice there should have been a choice between the cup, the sword, or the shield. I went back and looked at Series 4, the place of choice, when this was becoming something of an issue for me, and I thought, ah oh, yes, after Dickon redeems the crown there, you don't get the crown being offered to Jeremy or Giles. It's a complete inconsistency here in Series 6 that you can quest for the quest object that's just now been redeemed. That's one of the most annoying things about Series 6 for me. Nice integration of overriding plot and Sophia's individual quest here. Julius Scaramanga has the dragon caller. They're going to try and get it off him as part of the overriding nightmare plot and as their main task in level one. That's slotted together rather well. I think it does influence their choice of objects here. They know they're going to meet Julius Scaramanga. So, advisors Claire, Kim and Emma decide, using their nightmare knowledge, which is fairly extensive, as we can see at various points during this quest, they decide to take the silver. That's very logical, isn't it? We're going to meet Julius Scaramanga. We want the silver. I thought the same thing. And then the scroll explains all about the ring, which they know they're going to need as well. And yet later, Traegard's having a go at them. Oh, why didn't you take the lantern to light up the dwarf tunnels? You should have known that. Well, there's absolutely no clue to do that. And there is a clue to do something different. Not fatal. The Sophia's team. This earns them a bit of an undue telling off. When we get the same situation in series 7, where Nicola's team have a clue that they're going to need to buy something and they take some silver, and then later a bar of gold turns up and you think, oh, they should have left that silver, they're going to be dead now. How misleading. 
despite the fact that Nicola's team rejected a vital magic potion because of it, I do think that's very tough to be so misleading with object clues. And in both cases, it's the girl teams, isn't it, who get victimised, get led into taking silver and then get told, what you got the silver for, you stupid girls, you don't need that. I think it's a symptom of the terrible sexism or nightmare. But if you want to talk about taking incorrect objects, in level one, as in Sophia's case, let's look back to the previous team, Ben's winning team. They were supposed to take gold and silver in level one. They didn't. The scroll told them, almost explicitly, take the gold and the silver. But they thought it meant we have to take the gold or the silver. And there was even talk about whether which one you take related to which door to use to get out of the room, even though only one of them was an actual door. But they were let off anyway, with no fare for Smirkanov to fly them to level two. He just did it for free. Traeguard wasn't very impressed with that. I hope they've got something to give him for the ride. Uh, well, no, actually, but he's going to take them for free anyway. That's just one example of how Ben's team had far from a flawless quest. In fact, it was pretty flawed. Somewhere on a discussion forum, I think, one of Sophia's team said at one point, the team before us who won died three times, but were let off. We make this one mistake in level three, not knowing the answer to one question, and we're straight off because we're following a winning team. I mean, they're not wrong, are they? Ben's winning quest in series six is really impossible to fail. I've talked about level one and level two. There were only two clue objects to take, nothing even to leave behind. The ring and the pooper and the bottle. They even wanted to give the wrong one to Greystag. Level three is very linear. Again, like in level one, all they end up needing from the clue table is a bar of gold. Quite a nice tense scene with Ariadne, of course, in Ben's level three. But they don't have to actually do anything about her. It's purely for show, it's purely for atmosphere. And any sense of opposition on Ben's quest is purely for show. As Tregard says to Ben before he sets off on his quest, there'll be no talk of defeat on this mission. No, it's a guaranteed win. And poor old Sophia's team, who are just taking the first steps on a very long and impressive quest, well, they really won't get the chance to win under any circumstances. Which I was quite pleased about at the time, actually, because I didn't want to see two crowns in one series. But if there was any logic in this world of ours, which really there isn't, Sophia's team there would have gone for the cup, there being no option to go for the crown, and redeemed it, and being the second Series 6 winners, and the truly deserving Series 6 winners. Thank you for joining me for this episode commentary. Join me again next time as I talk about Nightmare Series 7, Episode 6.